So before I start, um, how many founder CEOs are here? Whoever is the founder CEO, please raise, raise your hands. Okay, um, and how many investors are here? Who's an investor? Don't be shy, come on. Even five, sh five shekels, it's okay. Great. Okay. So, first thing, Machik, thank you very much for having me here. Um, and uh, I, before I start, um, when Machik asked me to come here, I thought about Q4 and what I'm going to talk about uh, together with you guys here today. And I've seen quite a lot of companies in the past uh, year here in Poland. And one of the main issues that I'm seeing is what I'm going to talk about today. But the real problem, and that's why I asked about investors and founders, is that I come from building companies. But I work only in the early stage of companies, and I build them uh, to be successful. The main thing there is focus and ability to work well with your companies. Throwing a million dollars is very easy. To build those companies is very hard. And the startup founders are first-timers usually. They don't know and do too many mistakes. And the guy that is really paying the price is the startup founder. But we, as people that are also putting the money, are going to lose our money there. And the only way to be able not to lose your money there is to help your founder. And that's why I'm going to talk about the two perspectives today. Um, the, several of the companies, uh, the portfolio companies, heard about uh, half of this presentation today. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, the other half will help you also. So let's start. I'm going to talk about the strategic CEO, which is uh, irrelevant in early stage because it's almost impossible to be strategic at that point of time. But we have to help him. And when you are not a strategic CEO, this is what happened. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. That's exactly what happens, and we pay a price. Even in the stuff uh, that Lucas spoke about, HR, which sounds boring, by the way, to a lot of CEOs, it's so critical in a lot of times. Uh, I can give you an example of Sequoia Israeli company that uh, almost lost the company because stupid uh, HR decisions. Uh, moving to the US, Sequoia US told them, guys, here is your VP sales. Here's your CMO. These guys know the stuff, already did it. They'll take you there and don't talk. And the Israelis just took it. Only half a year afterwards, they discovered these sh the schmucks didn't do anything. And it took them time. And don't trust anyone else to do the work for you. It just doesn't work that way. So just a little bit regarding myself. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love building companies. Um, I'm one of the first uh, startup uh, founders in Israel that did SaaS companies. So I opened up also a group of teaching how to build SaaS companies in Israel. We didn't have knowledge and we didn't have employees at that point of time. Um, it was about uh, uh, 7,000 uh, founders there. I gave three years of uh, lectures on how to build and brought quite a lot of friends from the States. Um, I also very much believe in giving back to the industry and I think what Lukas is doing is very important. And you don't have enough people today here that are doing it just because there's not enough knowledge. But hopefully it will be and that's the industry is going to change. Uh, you helped build both the Microsoft Accelerator, now there's a new accelerator called the Ignite. It's an Intel Accelerator and also uh, an accelerator uh, for author Orthodox Israelis. So, first thing, the strategic CEO. Uh, when it comes to be strategic, the CEO always in early stage is a one-man show. We do everything from cleaning the offices to finding the offices uh, to uh, counting and doing all the things around and we don't have the time for shit. That's the biggest problem for us. We just don't have time even to think, and the zoom in, zoom out into the business is so crucial, and we pay a lot of prices that we don't do it on a daily basis, by the way, because startup at that point of time um, is something which is very, very much uh, in the changing, shifting, and uh, all the time doing the pivoting. The second point is the majority of the founders are first timers. You're a founder, but you're not a CEO. It takes time to learn. And you have to learn to be a CEO. And growing into that position is something that majority of the founders don't take the time because it's just not there. Either they have it or not, but you can learn it. There's a lot of stuff to learn, but our responsibility is also to teach them and to help them. And that usually is not done. So as a lonely founder, 
I have so many different things that I have uh, problematic for myself, okay? From issues with my co-founders that I have all the different discussions. And by the way, majority, by the way, I don't know how many investors you know, but in majority of the startups, early stage, the, th the reason that things do not shift quickly enough are the founders that are fighting bet between themselves. I don't know how many times I've seen it that internally, instead of managing the company, uh, one founder needed to teach another founder uh, and uh, then have all kinds of different discussions. And usually that is till the A round, but sometimes it's even more than that. And that we'll talk about in, the, in, in a few minutes. All, all the running after investors, all the issues that um, you don't have anyone else to discuss within the company that can teach you because you just don't have uh, that internal knowledge and you don't have anyone else that, that is helping you from the outside. All that, that's the reason that your CEO is not effective. And the main issue out of it is that we don't get to where we need to get to. What does that mean? First thing, if it's a VC company, we live from one round to the next round, okay? The strategic guy knows how to plan for the next round before he even raised the seed round, okay? That's the right thing to do, by the way. The guy that is not strategic, which is 99% of the cases, didn't even think about it till mid-year, okay? And I can't tell you how many companies I've, saw, I've seen till today that didn't really know all the different questions that you have to answer to yourself before you raise your seed round uh, and any other round afterwards. When I raise a seed round, usually it's a whatever amount, million, two, whatever it is, 18 months, I have 12 months to get to my KPIs, I have another six months to raise my money, and I need to be very focused on getting into those KPIs, okay? Doesn't matter what, I just can't live from one uh, end to the, uh, to, the, to the other. In your case here, you have a lot of companies that like to do the bootstrapping way or the uh, getting to the break even somehow, Afterwards growing, also in that case, they get it too late. And then we start to get to all kinds of problems that they come to us and ask for more money. And the responsibility was not only theirs, it was also ours. It's a two-sided way. So a lot of founders don't really understand what the difference or why is it so important, okay? Our tactical CEO, and that's what we usually do, okay? We work in the company. Employees, we do the bits and bytes of everything inside. We don't work on the company. We don't build it, okay? We're very much into the survival stage of uh, knowing exactly how many shekels we have here and how many we have there, and all the different uh, things that I need to uh, do, uh, cleaning of all the different fires that I have within my company. The strategic guy, and that's exactly where we need to find the time, and uh, what I'm gonna talk about today, how even in early stage companies, we find the time for the CEO to become strategic, okay? The strategic guy knows his vision, where he wants to be, where he wants to get to, and knows how to build his culture coming from it, and then building a strategy that gets him to his vision. And that strategy changes all the time, and, uh, and, but he knows how to tweak it for uh, his aim to get to his vision. And the last thing, he knows when and how to bring the right guys to execute on that strategy in order to get to his uh, vision. Majority of the founders in early stage just don't do it, and they get stuck. And we pay the price, they pay the price, everyone pays the price. Okay, so very nice. I spoke very, very high level. I'm gonna dive into a case study, so you, you'll know this is one of my companies that uh, I sold this year. Uh, it was a bootstrap company founded in 2010, um, and I joined in in end of 2014 in order to uh, change the company. Uh, four founders, uh, they didn't want to raise any more money or uh, from outside VC money. I wanted to invest in the company and build it together with them. They only wanted to do bootstrap, didn't want any outside money. The problem was that it was four founders and other four employees. They were doing uh, $29,000 almost, something like that, uh, uh, MRR, and they uh, were not able to grow. It was either we closed the company at some point of time or we're gonna shift it. So, let's dive into it. There's two, uh, three pillars that every company has. What, how, and why. Majority of the companies, and that's what we do, we talk about what we do, which nobody really cares about what we do, we do by the way. What we really care about, and why really people buy from us, which is the most important thing, by the way, 
why our customer buy from us, is why we're doing what we're doing. And the answer for that is mm, something that founders in early stage do not touch, okay? This is exactly what happened with Ystamp. When I joined in, Ystamp was doing, this is the what. If you come in, you can create a beautiful email signature. Uh, it was very, very much uh, related to freelancers and micro businesses that don't have the knowledge, don't have the time, and want to look professional tonight in any email they send out. And this is exactly what you can do in several minutes on Ystamp. Every email that goes out, you look really professional. And that's exactly what we did. How we did it, we took sophisticated uh, products that other companies, larger companies could do, and simplified it for the freelancer, for the small timer that doesn't have the time, and enabled him to look the same thing. But the first thing I asked Oli, the CEO of the company, was one question. Why the heck are we doing what we're doing? And this is, a, and this is where everything starts from. Okay? You see these faces? Each and every one of these faces is a real face, by the way. These are the real professions. And these are real paying customers of y -Stand. The reason Oli opened up her company was one thing. She believed in the market of freelancers and micro-businesses. It's the most growing market these days. And she wanted to empower them. She wanted to give them a tool that will help them to do whatever they want to do and not waste time on things that they don't want to do and don't know how to do them. Very simple. If you want to be a yoga teacher tonight, come on y -Stamp, become a yoga teacher, just do your yoga stuff, we'll do all the rest for you online. That was the dream. But if you take it back to the what, so far away from it. How the heck are we going to get there? No investment, nobody's going to put the money, nothing. This is the why. But from the why, the minute you discuss the why, comes this. Comes the culture. The kind of people we took into the company. Almost all the employees in the company were previous freelancers in development, in UI UX, in the marketing. All of them had the same issues, felt the same things. All of them related to what we were doing, had the same passion every day to come into the office and fight for these kind of things fight for something that they really believe in and enjoy looking every two seconds in real time people were creating these things over 300,000 unique new visitors every month people coming in creating and working on those kind of things that's something that people relate to and work with and stay of course within the company and this was our mission to help these kind of uh, self-employed guys and when you have that kind of mission you know where you're going and you know how you're doing. And that was the first thing we put there within our company, within the face of each and every one of the employees. But now, coming back, very nice that you have a vision, very much the, uh, nice that you have a culture, but at the end of the day, we need to do business. And the only way to do business is to do strategy, to understand how do I get from this point that I'm break-even, but not an interesting break-even, to my goal. And our goal was to create a platform that will help these guys. But we didn't have the money for that. That platform cost about $1 million. The founders were not willing to take money. There's only one way to get there. And that was one word that in any, pro uh, in any company that you do bootstrap, that's the only word we were allowed to talk, profitability. Okay? And the only thing that we did in 2015 was to build a strategy before we started. Okay? Uh, how are we going to become profitable. And what we built was assumptions. How are we going to get there? And the thing was that in order to do that, first thing you could look at the past. And we had the numbers from the past. All these numbers that you see are very, very nice numbers. I had revenues. I have how many paying customers I had. How many visits and it came from a, a CEO. A SEO, uh, what is my ARPU? All the different things. But data, you, it gets blended and you're not focused. So the one thing that we cared about is to take out of this and see where are we gambling on changing the stuff. We were charging $48 MRR, uh, ARR. We wanted to ch uh, check and we knew it wasn't uh, enough. We changed it into $72 ARR and we had a specific dashboard in order to monitor it. All the different assumptions like this that we had within that year, we built a dashboard, we built our program how to do it, and we executed in it. Things worked and things that didn't work. 
but we were able to kill the ones that don't work quickly, but know it without any discussion of, I feel that it didn't work, or those things. Everything was with numbers. Everything was, uh, we looked at, and we knew exactly what we, where we wanted to, uh, to get to. We, fin we finished 2015 with profitability of one, uh, uh, $350,000, which we were able to invest back into building our platform. Um, in 2018, we already finished the year with $1.2 million in net profit, okay? And every year, we change our strategy, of course, to, to get to our goal. But the main thing was, by strategy, by understanding where we need to get to, which was our vision, we were able to get to that profit profitability, invest that money in 2016 in building this. You come in, you create your uh, email signature. We know everything about you, who you are, where you're from, what's your business, everything, all your connection. You do Google Connect, do Facebook Connect, you, you do LinkedIn Connect, since you have that on your email. And we were able to take all that uh, data, extract it, create for you your website, the swags, uh, all your business cards designed and uh, printed and sent to you in three days in your house, and all, all your online listings from Google to Facebook to Foursquare, you name it, everything automatically done for you, and that's it. Go do your business. That was only from the profitability and the ability to invest our money back into the business. So that's about uh, uh, a little bit about strategy and how you connect that into your vision. Going back to your homework, anyone here, every CEO that didn't do this has to do this program every year, by the way. Q4 is the hottest Q in the sense of working in SaaS companies, majority of my SaaS companies, it's very, very hard. It's a very, very strong Q. We sell a lot, we're very much focused on sales, but at the end of the Q, we have to build our program, okay? We have to get the situation. I can't start 2020 without a plan and without a strategy that I'm gonna win that year. And in order to do that, I have to have a very uh, good understanding what is my vision, okay? Have a strategy that answers to that vision, okay? Have very clear defined company goals, not a lot of goals, very specific ones, but those goals that get me, okay, to where I need to get. Same thing like I spoke about uh, uh, Wisdom, what, uh, what we did there. See that every department knows the company goals, but built by themselves, their goals that answer to the company goals and get there, okay? And those things, by the way, we put on top and every morning I look up there and I can see that. So one of the main things that I also see that you don't uh, do, and the majority of my companies also didn't do it, building dashboards specifically for those goals. Because we have the main dashboard, which is very nice, but I have assumptions and I have questions that I need to answer in order to get to those goals. I have very specific KPIs, have very specific goals, and very specific dashboard that you build in order to monitor them. Because otherwise you get to bullshit stuff of discussion, is it working, yes or no, and you're not killing or investing more into things that you should be doing. Um, another thing that uh, uh, you're usually missing at that point in time is the right people. The, the mission that we need to, the strategic stuff that we're building is very much relevant to the kind of people we need. The minute we understand our mission, the minute we understand what is our challenges, we know exactly where we need to invest with, uh, with regards to employees. And that's, the, that's, very, that's why we do these kind of uh, steps. How do we buy time for the, uh, for the CEO? Which is, uh, again, the CEOs that are very early stage, for sure you're feeling every day that you just don't have enough time to do this, okay? It's very nice to talk about it, but I just don't have the time for it. So first thing, it's the responsibility of the founder CEO but it's also the responsibility of the people around him, okay? If it's his uh, co-founders, if it's uh, his investors, everyone around him. And for the founder CEO, in order to be successful at the end of the day, I need a strong management team that I can trust, which, again, I cannot build when I'm early stage. In average, we have three different managements that we shift, okay, within the life cycle of a company. Majority of my companies are like that. Just because we don't have enough uh, money to invest into the right guys at the beginning, and also we don't have enough knowledge of uh, who exactly do we need at that point of time. Second thing is my board of directors. The board of directors usually is not that strong in the beginning, but I need to know exactly who I want to bring in. So my founders, I want to know from day one, who are they going to bring in the A round or the B round? Who are the kind of investors that I want to have there? Because it's very relevant also to the kind of companies you want to build. If it's a local company, it's one, one thing. If it's, you want to go international 
and you don't know how to do it and there's not enough knowledge here to do it, you have to have those kind of investors that in your list you want to bring in and you, go, you want to fight on them. And the last thing is having someone from the outside. I have my co-founders, I have my management, I have my board. All these guys, each and every one of them has their own interest, okay? I always want to have someone who's smarter than me, has more experience than me, but he's outside of my company and he's coming in to help me. He's coming to, from the outside to tell me, listen, these are the things and talking to them and building those and that's an investment. The responsibility there, again, comes on the uh, founder CEO, but around him, people should be helping him. One of the uh, things that I'm seeing here is it's very similar to what we had in Israel about 20 years back. The industry is still in the beginning phases. There's not enough people uh, like Lukas that can come in and become an advisory board, okay? But you need to fight and fight them. But the other thing is it's still very early stage also in the investors. There's a lot of investors that are sending government, government money and not enough knowledge. And it's the responsibility both of the founder to find the best investor that can help him. Not always we can, by the way, and we know that it can. But it's also a responsibility of the investor to try and help the founder as much as, uh, as possible you know, when he knows that he doesn't have the knowledge and finding the kind of people that can help him. And that's a responsibility that you have to have a lot of biz dev. You have to go as, a, uh, as an investor to events. You have to find the right people that can help your companies, especially in early stage, because otherwise you're going to get screwed. Okay? And of course, it will help your founder, which uh, is very important. For the founder, majority of the founders that I'm seeing here, even the strong guys, are not um, going out or enough. Lukash was talking about interesting stuff, both of the books. I don't know if you read the entire Netflix presentation, but it's too long, 120 pages, something like that. But you did the homework, okay, which is great. Not a, not a lot of the founders here are doing that. Not international enough. And even if you stay here, even if you're going to build something big here, learn from the outside. Invest into that. Take the time, take your weekend, whatever it is. I, I, uh, I can tell that when I founded my first company, I didn't sleep. And it didn't, I think about 90% of the days, I didn't eat lunch because I didn't have enough time to do that. I just got to, to dinner and I was like eating like crazy and that's why I'm so fat. Uh, and took my whiskey at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning uh, just to get uh, to sleep uh, after I spoke to the Americans and everything. So all those kind of things, that's exactly the, the kind of responsibility that we have both as investors and founders. Another thing, and I've seen it a lot of good company, companies, by the way. There's a shift. A founder has to understand he has many, many different hats. I'm a founder, shareholder, board member, CEO, an employee, whatever it is, okay? These are different hats. It's not the same. And one of the main issues in companies that his co-founders don't understand it, okay? And at the end of the day, we have companies that are still managed by co-founders. They have a management, but the co-founders are managing the company. And very, very unique cases. There are companies, by the way, that succeeded by, in that way, but it's very, very unique. It's not good. Majority of the cases we get stuck. The founders are just bullshitting between themselves. And if you as an investor see it, and if a CEO founder gets stuck with his co-founders, that's something which is crucial. And that's why one thing that we need to do, from fund to fund, that's the difference between a bootstrap company that it's very hard to clean the table. In a venture-backed company, I have that chance when I do it in the seed, or pre-seed, or A round. In each and every one of the funding stages, I need to do not only the preparation, the Excel, the presentation on everything, but strategically thinking, what am I going to change? Who do I need in my board right now? Um, a lot of times I have someone in my board who is not relevant, he wasn't helpful for me, I need him out and I need to bring someone else, someone who can really help me build my company going ahead. I need an advisory board or I need a management or I need founders to get out of it. But all those things, I need that list in order to build my company and be successful. But at the end of the day, when I clean the table, a lot of the noise get out, gets out and I find that I have more time for myself to become more strategic, which is very crucial. And majority of the times we don't do it and then we get stuck more and more underneath that water that we can't find ourselves that we have enough time to do it. Another point that I want to talk about, strategic points, which is 
very crucial here. There's a lot of companies here that are staying here and not moving us uh, outside. I won't talk about that. But the, the companies that do want to become international, uh, we always need to move out, okay? Either Europe, States, I don't care where. Here I gave the example of the States, so I'll talk about that, okay? But the main thing is deciding, and this is strategic. Do I need to move? And if I do need to move, when do I need to move? One of the main things, first thing, and that happens a lot in my companies in, in Israel, what can happen to you, we leave in Israel our development and our product teams. We do all the sales and marketing in the States, okay, and B2B enterprise and those kind of companies. But when I moved to the States, I moved the CEO and going there, one of the biggest, biggest mistakes that I don't leave a leader in Israel. And that becomes a very, very big issue. And not leaving a manager is one thing. And not le leaving a leader is a very crucial part. And it takes time to build someone like that in the company. Because if I don't leave someone who's going to lead my, uh, my other office, I gonna, I'm going to be on the, uh, on the flight every day. And that happens a lot. And it happened in my companies with doing those kind of mistakes. And you're not allowed to do it. The second thing that happens from that is distrust between the two teams. Because... They do not deliver, and they do not understand. One of the main things that we do in the majority of my companies, everything that we do is online. And what Lukas was talking about, Zoom, majority of our calls with customers, success management, account executives, BDRs, SDRs, I don't care what, everything we have on our, uh, on our uh, cloud, and developers, product guys. Everyone that in Israel has to listen to those, uh, those uh, recordings in order to understand what's going on in America. And one of the main issues that become that the American sales guy doesn't understand why this stupid Israeli guy is not doing what he needs to do and not delivering or not understanding the customer. We fly a lot. The, the product guys fly to the US. They are on the calls, not only uh, on the Zoom, but also face to face to see the customers. And that happens a lot. But when I leave Israel and I don't have someone to lead the, the company, I get screwed. You have to have that. Um, where do I, uh, I move in the US? It's a critical uh, uh, decision. Costs a lot of money. A uh, sales guy uh, in San Francisco will cost me average 120. I'm not talking about the good guys. It's uh, OK guys, uh, which I can find it for 80, 90, uh, um, the same quality, I would say, in, in New York or other places uh, in the States, um, and the other places which are even uh, more cheaper. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there's different things that I need to look at. If I'm looking for investors in, in the valley, I have to be in the valley. If I'm looking for uh, people that, uh, this dev that I need to work, all my partnerships is there, all the M&A that I'm going to do there, all the different things, I need to know where do I need to, to be. But majority of the cases, I tend not to open up a big office in San Francisco. I just don't like the mentality there of employees. It's very, very hard. Uh, you pay a lot of money and there's knowing that it's going to stay with you. They get an offer, another for one check on, they'll leave you. So um, in San Francisco, usually uh, we try to do smaller uh, offices if we need them, doing biz dev uh, and also uh, close to, to the investors or those kind of things. Majority of the uh, companies, we do it outside and find uh, other locations uh, to be at. U.S. employees, Israelis, we have a lot of issues with that. The Americans look good, they talk good. Um, and we just don't know who's, uh, who's the right guy for us. And the one thing that uh, uh, we try to do is the first guy that we bring in, today we have enough good uh, Israelis that live in the States, and we start with them if we can, because it's similar to, to what we're doing, and they have already the expertise. Another thing is we need to build a culture that works well between the Israelis and the Americans. The same thing that you guys are going to have in each and every one of the different countries you go into, okay? At the end of the day, understand the local country culture, understand what it is, but also see how an Israeli or how a Polish person can work with the American. And at the end of the day, it has to work. It, it, and there's no compromises. It doesn't work in compromises. It has to work in a sense of the, the kind of person that you're bringing in. So that's why when an Israeli manager will sit with an American, they'll ask you who you are because we care about the kind of person he is. And the American always talks only about his CV. They have exactly what to, to go through. 
and we have all kinds of ways of, to know exactly who am I working with and uh, who's uh, interesting or relevant for us. Another thing is investors in the States. I need to know exactly who are the kind of investors I want to work with and that they're interested in what I'm doing, but it also can help me. A lot of the things that I do with my companies, let's say when we're moving to the States, is building a management team, finding the right guys. I'm not talking about when we move, usually it's not even the C-level guys, which I uh, tend not to take at that point of time. More, I like more the younger guys that can really fight and are still hungry. In the States, a lot of the guys that already done it, either they are in a box that they cannot create new stuff, but also don't have the passion to build a new startup. And the younger guys are much, much more uh, um, cooperative in order to, to do that. But the investors, that there are investors that have huge investment into HR, and they have HR teams within the VCs, okay? And they really help you build it. And the smart guys uh, try to understand your culture, your thinking, and combining it. Uh, the example I gave about Sequoia, that was an example that they did in the beginning. They didn't understand the difference in, in the cultures. But it's very crucial to find good partners there that can really help you. Same thing, by the way, for advisory boards and those kind of things are crucial to do it and go to uh, other companies locally here that went internationally, learn from them how they did it, what the mistakes they've done, because for sure they learned quite a bit. Just, okay, so uh, a little bit of points that I do uh, by myself also, and uh, I know that other people also do, but in order to be a successful CEO, especially in early stages companies, we don't have a lot of time. I always come out of the office 10 o'clock at night, Maybe I've done 10 or 20% of what I wanted to do, okay? But in order to be successful, so the first thing I do, I, uh, I commute on the train. I have 40 minutes on the train from uh, where I live uh, to Tel Aviv. And at that time, I just t take all the things I want to accomplish and I build all the three goals, two, three goals that I want to achieve that day. And I focus on them. And I have the time to prepare myself for that day, not just coming straight away into the office, not thinking of what, what am I going to do, but that time to reflect on what you want to do and to achieve that day really helps you to focus yourself and focus on those prior priorities. Meetings, I hate bullshit meetings. Uh, usually uh, those meetings are too long and you'll see that you're doing meetings that are rubbish. The first thing, be Israeli, have chutzpah. I tend to cut meetings in the middle. Don't give a shit. I don't care what we came in for. But the minute you see bullshit, get up, say it's bullshit, explain why it's bullshit, and tell them next time you're coming in like this, you get fired. Okay? I don't like those kind of things. And that's very crucial because we don't have time in early stage startups for bullshit. We're very focused and we need to get to where we need to and we need to shift very quickly in between. Another thing is, within the day, we're in the office, we are so much into things, try to do the zoom in, zoom out on a daily basis. The zoom in, zoom out that I'm talking about is being strategic versus tactic. On the daily basis, when I go out it, from one environment on the office, outside, it's very crucial. Majority of the startups we have are in too big uh, buildings that are too high. Uh, and still, I want to go out, I want to sit out. And a lot of times I do it also with an employee. It doesn't have to be a manager, by the way. I want to hear people and I want to take that time also to reflect on my company. I want to understand exactly what f people feel and think. And that time outside also helps me. Try to find that time, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is, in order to do it. It'll clean your head also, but at the same time, you'll be able to learn much more about yourself and your, uh, your company. So coming just to, to the end of the strategic CEO, the thing is, we want to get here. These nice clouds, after three, four, five years, you can really be there. That means that I have a very strong management team, I have a very strong board and advisor board, and I'm there, that's the fun. By the way, I've been in all these stages of the companies too many times, and it's fun to be a strategic CEO, and it's yes, fun to have a, a management team that does it for you. But in order to get there, you have to find the way to in each, each and every one of the stages to find how you do it. And it doesn't have to be all the different things that I mentioned here. A lot of times they happen to you that I find one guy in my company that I can trust that he's a doer. That's it. 
in early stage, that's all you care about. He can deliver. And one of the main challenges, by the way, and Lucas spoke about it before, is that people do not deliver. We find because we don't have enough time and we don't have enough money and we do mistakes. And anyone, 50%, by the way, is very good. Uh, a lot of the times, especially in the beginning, we don't know how to hire. We do the mistakes and we just need to find that guy. That will take a lot of pressure out of, out of us. If it's my partner, it's great. A lot of times it's not my partner. And then I get to the situation that everything is on me. You have to get out of that situation as fast as possible and find that guy because usually that guy is also the guy that is operative and he's running the company in parallel to me when I go out for a round. Because when I do a round, I'm almost 100% into it. I don't bullshit myself in rounds. Founders that do a round and go out to raise $10 million and think that they can do it together with running their company for 100% are bullshitting themselves. And that's exactly the way that you lose your companies. So hopefully this helped you guys. Hopefully you have a little bit of homework from here. But uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.